The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Hey, guys. Buddy. Hey, buddy. What's going on, man? Uh, just chilling. Sadly, I missed the eclipse. I mean, I tried to see it, but um, they uh, cloud seeded or they didn't turn on the harp machine to clear the clouds or something, you know. <laughs> Obviously, it was the government's fault. Did you get yeah. you, you were in the totality zone, but it was clouds? Yeah. Yeah, I and went so to what, uh, what was the what was that experience? So it must have gotten pitch dark then, right? Yeah, it was nighttime, especially with the clouds. Yeah. Like it was basically yeah. nighttime. All of the street lamps kicked on and everything. But that's uh, cool. Yeah, I went to West Texas, which, you know, you'd kind of think West Texas, it should be really dry. But, um, you yeah, know, we just had a bunch of storms roll in, which is actually somewhat common for this time of year. I mean, it was raining yeah. a lot when we were down there for Finney Forum. It was cloudy, it was, rainy uh, most of the time. Yeah. I should have just stayed in Mexico. People went to um, to Mazatlan oh, and they got a really yeah. good view. Shit. But, it was clear? It was clear down there? Yeah. Uh, I've seen an eclipse. I've seen a total eclipse before, though. I went to Jackson Hole in 2017, and uh, that's you know that's kind of how I knew it was. It was something else, right? It wasn't just like you know when you were in school and you used the glasses and you're like, oh wow, it's 85 percent or it's 50 percent, right, right. right? Like completely but, different um, experience. I wanted to try and get my uh, my nieces and nephews to be able to see it. You know, they're still kids, so um, yeah, I wanted them to to hopefully see it. But uh, yeah, the weather wasn't compliant, or the weather gods were. Or the gods uh, of the weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my daughter, I brought my daughter and, you know, it was, it was definitely experience. I told her, well, you know, we'll, we'll see another one maybe in 30 years. Although, unless we go to Egypt, I think that's, did, did you see that body? Have you, did you look at the, the ones that are coming up? Uh, th- I saw one. Three I saw that, that are going like, through Spain. Yeah, I saw that one. Is that the same one going through Egypt? Yeah, yeah. Three, that, that one, uh, there's one in three, there's like three different uh clips eclipses that will be happening in you know the next uh i think like all within the next five years and they're all going through spain i remember after 2017 i think it was like maybe it was 2019 or 2020 um there's supposed to be an eclipse in argentina and i was like that's it i'm going i'm gonna fly down to argentina and then i was like eh, yeah never really made it down there <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's hard to Find the yeah, effort. so all I'm saying is we'll see, you know, how the inertia feels when uh, Spain and Egypt come around. What what year did you say that was? 25, 26? I think it's 27. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, I've been meaning to take kind of a, a long Europe tour for a long time. So, you know, like go there for two or three months and just kind of explore around yeah. Europe. Yeah, so should we have, you know, maybe do a Monerotopia there, southern southern Spain? Beautiful, beautiful place. I've yeah. been to Spain. I haven't been to southern Spain, but I can only imagine. It looks it looks amazing. What about like, um, oh, you mean like do it during the eclipse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Egypt would be cool too. And that's like guaranteed clear skies. I mean, unless you have like a sandstorm or something. But <laughs> <laughs> could always hop in an airplane and try and try and get above the clouds or a sandstorm yeah. that way. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Matt, take, take it away. Take it away. Cool. Yeah. So um, we had kind of a, a price drop across the board. Uh, I guess it was yesterday or maybe um, yeah. recently, like this week, at the end of this week, uh, which, you know, really wasn't wasn't that big a deal. So we're on the one hour chart here. This is Bitcoin. Uh, you know, it was kind of hovering just above the previous all time high and then took a dip down to 65,000 seems to be hovering at the moment. Um, you know, like. Nothing. There's really nothing there to, to be concerned about for the moment. I still tend to think that that there there is the opportunity to go higher with this recent drop. You know that kind of changes it changes the outlook just slightly. You might say, yeah, that that that's showing a bit of weakness there. Um, in a macro sense, you would say that there's still probably um, there's still probably availability pump uh, that could happen. But we also saw with stocks, we, we saw stocks kind of fall out of their um, out of their channels. And I know it's kind of been a couple weeks uh, since we last spoke here. Um, but yeah, stocks have all kind of fallen out of their channels. Um, and, you know, everything else is is kind of like showing a little bit of weakness. So that's the that's the big backdrop there that we're looking at. 
Uh, Monero also experienced the same um, experienced the same drop as everything else did, um, just like kind of temporarily. Yeah. So okay, let's take a look at uh, so Xano. That's fine. It can pump. You know, it's a new coin. Um, that's slightly different. But like, take a look at Pirate Chain. Within the course of a single week, you get this like this massive pump here. It made. 158%, right? So that's like uh, 2.5x, basically. So that pumps 2.5x. Darrow, uh, Darrow made, within the span of one week, also um, like also a 2.5x. Um, yeah, and then Monero doesn't get any of that. So one thing I thought was interesting we could look at, too, is the Monero versus Zcash. Um, so obviously, we know what this... So this is Monero divided by Zcash. So as this chart goes up, uh, that means Monero is getting uh, valued higher relative to Zcash. And obviously, you know, we, we suffered a pretty significant loss, basically minus 50% against Zcash with the uh, with the finance announcement, the horrible delisting. But what you'll notice is that already we're basically back in the same, like just now recovering to that same zone that we'd been at for really like a whole year there. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. <clears throat> we uh, it's, it's it's completely unsurprising. Right. I am Jack's complete lack of surprise here. Um, but. I just I think it is interesting that when you look at all these little weird shit coins and everything else, you get these crazy two x, three x, four x pumps, and and Monero just just has none of that. So it, it does tell you that there is something different. It at at a very at a bare minimum, it makes you ask the question, um, why? Like why would that be the case? I think we all you know here in Monerotopia, we all basically have a pretty good idea of what's going on there. Uh, and yeah, I mean, look look at the the people that are involved in those projects, right? They seem to be the same. The same crew, right? Yeah, it's uh, the same cabal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is, you know, l let them do their thing. The same but people, cabal is... But people just uh, be, be aware of it, guys. Uh, you know, be yeah. cautious there. Like, what, like, why would Pirate Chain just 3x out of nowhere? What Was there some... Uh, did they implement full membership proofs or something? Did, <laughs> did, Luke, did Luke Parker start working on Pirate Chain? Like, what, 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 what bullish thing happened? <laughs> Like, I think there actually was, other, I can't remember what, someone like I saw it on Twitter. It was an, I should have saved it. I should have made a note of it. It was like some offhand thing. Pirate Chain was being accepted for something somewhere. Maybe, maybe I'm just hallucinating that okay. memory at this moment. But yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, I guess back to Monero. In terms of like relatively, how did we perform? Um, obviously, you know, the two big ones to look at are Monero versus Bitcoin and Monero versus Ethereum. You know, those two coins effectively comprise... I mean, it's like 70 or 80 percent of the market cap of cryptocurrency. Um, but anyways, so, yeah, Monero, in terms of like everything falling, kind of the drop off that happened in the past few days, Monero performed you know, relatively about the same. I guess it, there was a little bit of a drop off here relative to Bitcoin. I say little Jesus, that's 10 percent technically. Um, I mean, I would still call this a bottoming pattern, right? It, how long does it take for this bottoming pattern to play out um, is anyone's question. One thing that I wouldn't like in a technical sense here, like as a sort of a, a counterpoint to what I just said about this potentially being a bottoming pattern. Oh, you know what? I just realized something. My charts are really, really wide, aren't they? There we go. Now everyone knows the resolution of my main monitor, double wide monitor. Uh, hopefully that's better. Can you guys see a difference there? Yep. Looks okay. good. Hopefully it's taking up the, I don't know, correct amount of space on the screen. Uh, okay. Okay. So anyways, um, one thing that I don't like here in a technical sense um, on the RSI, so that's that's the purple line here. I always, I need to change this. I never really look at RSI, but everyone likes it. So I, um, let's just remove the, um, the yellow. I, I, I prefer RSI to be yellow just because the contrast looks nice. Okay, so anyways, we're looking here at RSI. Make that line a little bit thicker. One thing that I've said for a long time about RSI, so... This is this would technically be called a bullish divergence, as we've talked about for the past few weeks. Um, price is making lower lows uh, while the RSI is making higher lows, right? So you're basically showing momentum developing towards the upside. The only thing that I don't like about this is that I typically consider RSI to be reset once it's hit that 40% level um, from the lower side or the 60% level if you were coming from like bearish divergence right from the top. Um, so in a sense, you might say that that RSI has been reset, although this pattern has been developing for a while now. So it's it's possible we could we could go to the weekly here. Um, and it doesn't quite look like like bullish divergence uh, on the weekly. Um, the, the thing I mean, the main thing in my mind <clears throat> that I would say here is that. At the end of 
I, I expect that um, the next bull mark, uh, sorry, the next bear market in crypto will probably see the ratio of Monero and Bitcoin improve. Uh, so that just seems to make too much sense to me, right? It, it's just it's just too easy to say, yeah, they're gonna the people that want to keep Monero suppressed are gonna buy their bags, are gonna try and acquire it when no one's watching, when nobody cares, when the plebs have left and the excitement and the hype is gone. They're gonna try and and acquire enough bags that they can sell that on the market during um, during hype times because again, don't want you buying Monero. They just absolutely don't want you to have it. Uh, and it's amazing to me, like I. I Honestly, every day, guys, every day I muse on this. I'm just like, how is it possible that like everything else is listed? Everything else is fine. Everything else is kosher. Bitcoin gets included into the into the uh, traditional finance system. And the Monero is just being relentlessly attacked from all sides like and has been for years now. I just still I, I, I can't fathom how a single Bitcoiner couldn't look at that and say to themselves, yeah, there's some important signal there. Um, I mean, of course, I can fathom why they don't do that. You know, obviously, it's an emotional kind of thing. Human psychology, monkey brain, tribal dynamics, etc. Um, but yeah, uh, that that is that is a, a poignant thought in my mind. Um, okay, let's look at Monero versus Ethereum because, again, Ethereum number two market cap coin comprises a significant amount of market cap. And again, we're looking at a very similar, very similar action here. Um, you know, I really, this kind of chart, like, this thing should go up at some point to that lower standard deviation line. And, and in fact, it really already should have done that. Um, like in a, in a pure technical sense, right? Like there's, there's other ways of looking at the market other than just technical, but I look at that and I say, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's suspicious. Uh, one thing we haven't looked at for a while is the XMR longs for, minus the XMR shorts on our very trustworthy exchange Bitfinex. Um, and right now you'll notice an interesting pattern that developed really since the middle of 2022 We've basically been right near that zero point. Like there's a slight, a slight bias towards XMR longs, but um, overall, like we we just have not seen the kind of oscillations that we've seen um, uh, that that we saw for you know for years, especially in in the most recent bull market. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Something I just kind of noticed this morning that uh, we sort of flatlined there almost on the on the longs versus shorts. But it's also Bitfinex. So like, <laughs> how much do we trust them? Do we really do we really care? I don't know. It's it's worth looking at, I suppose. Uh, let's see, we've got some um, Poloniex, uh, is always doing weird, crazy shit with their price divergences. Um, they like to be minus 10%, minus 5%. Currently they're actually pretty good. They're only like minus 2%, um, which is, which is uncommon for them to be, uh, to be that closely pegged. So everything else is still somewhat, um, somewhat near the zero point. Again, I do think it's important to multiply by volume on this chart. Um, it's just a matter of, I need to take the time. Um, to go metic meticulously through every single ticker that I can find where Monero is traded um, versus USDT and um, oh, USD, USDT, maybe even USDC if it's out there, uh, just to go through every single ticker that's out there and then compile all of that data to tell you what the volume weighted price divergences look like. Um, I bet you there's signal in there. Um, uh, at some point, uh, anyways, at some point I'll get it done and I'll let you guys know when, when I do that. It's just kind of like on the back burner. Uh, mostly because I don't volume. <laughs> I just don't trust crypto volumes. Um, okay, let's take a look at some of the uh, some of the altcoins, some of the shit coins. Um, you know, actually, before we do that, um, let me let me talk a little bit of a little bit of a news piece. Oh, you know, also, um, let me pull up YouTube again. Uh, I should be looking at the YouTube comments. Just when my system crashed, I tried to get up and running as fast as possible. Uh, let's see here. I just want to make sure that I'm getting getting people that are asking questions on YouTube. Okay, 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 okay. Um, there, Florida, there's not, there's just not much to say about the, um, the XMR, uh, the XMR, um, USDT, sorry, XMR USD chart. Um, I, I would say at the, at the moment, I don't like the way this chart looks, um, in terms of, uh, of the wave magic in terms of these standard deviation lines. I don't like that we're well below, we're like now trending below the orange bands here. That that's really, that's not a good sign. Um, if the rest of the crypto market starts to pull back, Monero is going to suffer the effects of, of broadly um any major pullbacks in crypto um or you know bear markets right like it's possible who knows this could be the top and we could be going for a bear market here for the next year that's that's totally possible um i don't necessarily think that's the highest probability thing at, at the moment but um it's certainly not a remote possibility and given that i really i just don't like the way the chart is currently set up with monero trending below these bands um maybe uh you know maybe 
maybe Monero doesn't have to follow nearly as much down with the rest of the market. Um, I mean, it doesn't seem to be following up with the rest of the market. So uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see on that. Um, but in terms of the rest of the technicals, like the only thing that the only thing I could really show you would be like hourly charts, which I haven't I haven't prepared any short term charts on Monero um, at the moment. I feel like if I'm being really honest, guys, I don't feel I, I have an emotional component when it comes to Monero analysis. And I also have a little bit of kind of like the bias of I want to tell you guys good things. And so it it biases me when I analyze the Monero chart, which is a reason I don't trade Monero. Like I, I just try and like keep my hodl. Um, when I have profits, I try and move a portion of those into Monero. Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of like a, a recognition of my own self limitations in that regard. Um, maybe I'll try and, um, maybe I'll try and overcome that and give you some short term analysis. Uh, the other thing too, is that I, I regard short term, short term technical analysis to be much less reliable than long term analysis. So in, in terms of the long term analysis on Monero's, Monero's chart here, um, I guess one thing you could say was interesting is that, um, Let's try and draw this line a little bit better. So this line right here, um, you'll notice that kind of one of the best fit lines we could draw sort of had that um, that wick there uh, on the delisting. You'll notice that wick basically touched that line. So that could be kind of a good sign in a way that's saying, hey, this line right here really is, you know, like we really are leaving that behind. That's really going to become irrelevant now. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we just trend sideways. Um, you know, we had, you'll also notice that we had kind of like a double bottom here. Let's drop a horizontal line there. Uh, we double bottomed from the bear market low uh, that happened in June of 2022. Um, so again, that was kind of like an interesting confluence of place that you might expect to actually hit a low there. Uh, at the moment, like overall, I still, I still don't like the way this chart looks. And I, I could only tell you that from like somewhat of an instinctive perspective here, like just my intuition. Um, maybe we can try and uh, draw some more pleb lines. Um, this is always dubious, you know, like I'm just doing this in real time with you guys right here. This is something I might do on my own, like just try and draw some pleb lines and see how that looks, you know, like, okay, maybe, maybe there's kind of like a downtrend there. Um, you know, pleb lines were meant to get broken. Uh, I guess we go back to the daily. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps at the moment we might try and draw some kind of, um, some kind of pattern that would look like this, where we've got this sort of sideways triangle, um, Maybe we draw that line a bit like that. Again, it's it's always slightly dubious. Um, you know, maybe if we can break this to the upside, maybe that would spell some upside. Um, one thing that you'll notice that that did happen in 2021 is that Monero um, had a big pump with the rest of the market just before that massive crash in May of 2021. So perhaps there is like some steam pressure building up on Monero here. Perhaps we could see some big pump to the upside, maybe back to the $200 range. Um, before you know, we get some big major pullback in the crypto market, and it is interesting because like there has been very few major pullbacks uh, in crypto and Bitcoin for months now. Like things pump to the upside here, and just have continued pumping. I don't think we've had anything more than maybe fifteen percent. What would that be? I guess that'd be twenty percent. We haven't had it like a forty percent pullback, right? Which is the kind of thing we've seen with other um, with other bull markets typically in the past. Um, so yeah, so far there, there's no major pullback here um, right now. Bitcoin is still consolidating. So we kind of had talked about that a, a week, uh, two, maybe two or three weeks ago now, where we said, "Hey, maybe Bitcoin needs some consolidation time here. It's gone pretty far. We're sitting here at these all time highs. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe that these highs are." I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard to say. Obviously, the ETF had real money moving into Bitcoin because now it's okay for all the plebs in the in the traditional finance markets. It's okay for them to buy Bitcoin now because it's an ETF and it's approved and wholly and sanctified by the uh, by their overlords. So um, you know, they they threw a bunch of money at it. Uh, at the same time, I kind of think, hey, that's an opportunity for a lot of insiders to unload their bags. It's a massive amount of volume. And last time we were at these prices two years ago. Um, two years ago, uh, three years ago, really, yeah, three years ago, um, insiders were unloading their bags, right? That's what they were doing at these prices. Um, so yeah, no, it's 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 dubious. Uh, it's 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 questionable. Are are they really unloading all their bags? No, probably not. Um, at the moment, you would say that we have kind of this pennant forming on the Bitcoin price right here. Um, a break of this large pennant will probably result. Will, will probably signal um, the next direction. And, and when I say break, I mean confirm, sustained break. One thing that you can do in trading. Um, Notice that things got above, right? And then the very next day, close below. So this will trap a lot of people. When you're trading, this, this pattern will trap a lot of people. You'll break this um, this kind of like this line here. And actually, that's a, kind of a poorly drawn line. Let's draw it more like that. Let's 
do. We'll try and make this as shallow as possible and use the daily close price instead of the daily wick price up there. Although normally, normally I would say to do it up there um, because we have two wicks that reach that price. I know that <laughs> this is a messy chart, guys. Hopefully this makes sense to you guys. Um, okay, so anyways, we've got our little pleb line drawn here. We're saying, hey, we're gonna trade. We're gonna trade off of pleb lines. And uh, and then oh look at this on uh, on Monday uh, of this week Bitcoin breaks to the upside it breaks that downsloping line all right we're gonna go off nope nope the next day it closes right below and so this is something you can do you could say okay yeah we broke the line we closed the day above it but did we close the second day above it do you have two consecutive closes above that pleb line if not then you could be about to get taken for a ride and this happens very often like this is a good way to protect yourself. Um, from false breakouts that, that happens, like if you're a short-term trader or whatever. So, um, I mean, it, at the same time, like this is this is bullish somewhat action, right? You're looking at that saying, hey, you know, it was kind of flirting with breaking, then it came to the downside. Maybe you got to crush some of those longs that, that that came in here, right? Probably a lot of people trying to get long right there. Uh, maybe crush those longs, crush the uh, leverage traders, and then break it, you know, a little bit later um, after some more consolidation. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, I still tend to think that Bitcoin... My balance of probabilities puts Bitcoin at eighty thousand or slightly higher before um, before we get the next major major crash or pullback. Um, but you know, I'll let the markets tell me in real time um, if, if that's going to be the case. Right now, this chart does look bullish. Um, it does look like there's more juice to squeeze. Bitcoin dominance also um, has been looking bullish, and as much as I hate to say that, um, I've been maybe for the past couple of weeks I've kind of been looking at this chart, thinking, yeah, this thing is starting to look kind of bullish. Um, and then we had that break recently, so. At, I mean, technically, we're still kind of below this pleb line right here. We're kind of on the underside of that pleb line. Doesn't necessarily mean that we're we're going, you know, that this, I say we, I don't know, I say we, I'm not a Bitcoiner. Um, uh, anyways, uh, so this thing could could definitely get, so notice this line right here. This area, right, this area, which was back from 2020, um, when Bitcoin, uh, you know, when the dominance was just really, really crushing it. And, um, you know, we had to hear all the narratives back then. Bitcoin still hasn't even touched that time, you know, that lower that lower area. It hasn't gotten anywhere near um, to the area to the level that it was back in in 2020 and 2019. Um, I think most of this was spurred on by Plus Token Ponzi, scooped up a shitload of Bitcoin. Um, and it's funny because the top of the market in 2019, that that um, that reaction rally in mid 2019, the exact top of the Bitcoin market there was was literally the day that those guys got arrested. Um, anyways. So, uh, yeah, I'm not convinced. Again, like I keep saying for a long time, I'm not convinced of where the Bitcoin dominance chart goes. I think long term, this chart should trend towards the downside. I just don't see how Bitcoin is, especially with all the problems they're having now. Um, it's kind of funny, though, because the problems they're having now might actually support their price, right? They've got the degeneracy. they got the NFTs and the BRC20 tokens. They can get a lot of that market cap wrapped up into their chain now. And that might actually be in a big way saving their price, Like, which, which is funny. Um, there's another thought I had here that that I, uh, this week that um, it's if you look at the narratives from the maximalists, it's funny because their narrative was something like dollar milkshake, like Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is going to force all of the governments to participate. Um, it's going to be so good at competing; everyone's going to be using it. The governments, you know, they'll have to hash wars, and and they'll have to like even if they don't want to, governments will have to incorporate Bitcoin into their into their reserves and their finances. Um, because Bitcoin is so good that it'll force their hand. That's, but that's not why. That's not how and why Bitcoin actually got incorporated into the U.S. traditional finance system. Um, there was no court cases that said, "Hey, you," except for the ETF, right? But Bitcoin is not incorporated as reserves. Bitcoin, they didn't like really, really try and suppress massively suppress Bitcoin. They said, "Hey, you know, it's a good, it's a good asset." They, they like some of these guys, some of the top guys. I think it was Charlie Munger. It was like, we're going to we're going to get control of Bitcoin. Maybe it was Warren Buffett. Like, hey, we're going to get control of Bitcoin. Um, and it kind of looks like they did. Right. And Bitcoin isn't actually used for hardly anything. There was no like forcible hand that forced the United States government to incorporate it. They just kind of chose to do it because it seemed it seemed useful. So anyways, that's just kind of like a rant. Like, yes, Bitcoin is being incorporated into traditional finance, but not because it forced their hand because hyper Bitcoinization is in progress. Like there's almost no like hyper Bitcoinization in progress. Um, so anyways. Uh, we we got the we got the dominance here. It is it is still looking good. It is still on an uptrend. So um, just uh, you know just just know that that could continue for a while. Uh, maybe we could take a look at some shitcoins too. Why not? Hey, uh, this is the current status of some very popular shitcoins. Um, maybe these are maybe I'm just a boomer when it comes to shitcoins and like there's a whole new set that uh, <laughs> that I should be looking at. Um, I don't know. 
But uh, yeah, everything you can see, everything fell off this week in, in terms of their Z-scores. Again, these are Z-scores, so it compares their own volatility, right? This, this is a, a representation of how they're performing relative to itself, relative to its typical volatility. So that's why they're all like kind of centered around the zero line. Um, that's, that's what a Z-score is supposed to do. Um, very useful statistical thing for, for anyone out there that um, pays attention to stats, has a little bit of stats background. Z-scores can, can really normalize charts that have totally disparate, um, disparate performance, dis disparate values. Like Z-scores are really good at, at normalizing things so that you can compare them side by side in a certain way. Um, but yeah, everything's gone down. I guess um, I'm not really seeing anything of note on this chart. Um, I guess Monero, we had a little like spike, like, right? I don't know if you guys can see that right here in the last, like, what is today? 13th? Oh, I guess today. Yeah. As of today, Monero has, has had a slight recovery here that, uh, that doesn't look like the other coins, um, have had, they all kind of leveled out a little bit. Maybe. Yeah. That was slightly. interesting to me. Cause I was watching this, uh, yesterday, uh, cause it there was like a, I guess, correction that happened and everything just kind of seemed to tank like 10% and I mean, including Monero, but then Monero quickly came back and it hasn't been down as much as the others were excluding Bitcoin. Um, but all the other altcoins are down 10 to 13%, but Monero is only down less than 6%. So right now as it stands. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's um that's kind of funny because that's a little microcosm of the bear market action that we've that we've talked about that during a bear market uh, Monero should you know in a long term bear market Monero seems to be seems to perform better um, than other coins probably because of its its actual usage as as money it's actually that usage. but then at the same time I mean there's no correction for Monero to be made it's already been like kicked to the curb before uh, yeah. all this pumping happened and it never quite take off like everything else yeah that's that's a good point I mean. I hope, fingers crossed, I really, really want to hope that um, because of all the negative action we've had, because of like just the big washout, and, and I mean, it should be that most of the only people that are left here are the people that are actually using this thing that actually want Monero. Um, my hope is that that really limits our downside in any kind of like negative price environment. Uh, I would love to be able to tell you guys that that, that would definitely be the case. Um, but I can't tell you that because I know I just know that the people that want to suppress Monero are powerful and they have a lot of little tricks up their sleeve. So, uh, you know, all right. I, I guess that we just got to accept that, right? We just got to accept that and um, keep using it, keep improving. Um, I am like super impressed that uh, like that, that's crazy how fast Luke is getting um, is getting full membership proofs rolling. On yeah, this thing. like I mean, just single handedly. That's incredibly bullish, if anything. I mean, our transaction count is going through the roof. We're, you know, we have, we're making amazing. Well, artificially. Yeah, but it's it's still happening though, right? Uh, we, you know, we don't, what, whatever it may be, the but the usage of the Monero system is going up, right? Uh, art, actually... Artificial or not, but it's it's for me that's an, another bullish indicator. Uh, the techno technological improvements that are happening. Um, and then just adoption overall, people actually using Monero. I mean, all those things are, are trending up. Um, and, you know, just it's inevitable that network effect will kick in and the value of the coin will, will start to match the value of the network. They, can, they, they can't suppress that, right? Because at some point, um, the, the value of the, of the network of the coin will reflect the value of the network and the value of the network just keeps going up. I mean, it's, it's a matter of people actually using it, you know, the, um, whether or not people are, are truly using it for transactions, which, which we are like, people really are using it. Um, in a lot of ways, I tend to think that sort of that core of philosophically consistent people that were in Bitcoin, 2014, 15, 16, um, you know, before that massive 2017 bull run, the people that were in Bitcoin for the reasons of digital freedom money, I feel like those are the people that are here in Monero. And most of the people that came after, those guys are probably mostly just concerned about number go up. That's not to say we haven't added more people that are concerned about freedom as well. And um, it's just that, you know, I think they're like fair, they would call them sunshine patriots. I think that's Samuel Adams. <laughs> hmm. Samuel Adams. Uh, you know, like they're, 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 they're libertarians, they're, they're freedom, they're freedom oriented, but they're sunshine patriots. Like if they don't get those mad gains on their crypto, then eh, they don't really care too much. Crypto failed. Right. 
And this is what they what they say about Monero. Ah, it doesn't have the mad gain, so it failed. I tend to think that Monero basically just still has that very similar level of um, of digital freedom money support that um, that Bitcoin had back in um, you know back in those somewhat still early days. That's totally speculative on my part, but it, it just kind of feels that way. Um, you know, and the other thing too is that you've got Bitcoin Cash and it's got all its problems, but a lot of those people did go to Bitcoin Cash, and it does seem like a lot of those people are still there. It's unfortunately that unfortunate that we seem kind of a little bit divided. Um, I'll never support Bcash probably. <laughs> like as long as Monero works and isn't at capacity or whatever, like I'll be using Monero, not Bcash, and or I'll be using some other shitcoin for you know whatever degenerate purposes I might be using, or you know maybe I'll be in Argentina and just using Tether, <laughs> which requires you to use Tron or Ethereum. Um, that was part of that that tweet you mentioned, Doug. Mm -hmm. um what's the guy's name george gavin uh, yeah yeah so he was talking about um was it him or uh no i think it was um it was one of our guys uh gombat was talking about okay. he was posting charts that us usb dt was is used significantly in argentina for like big purchases yes yeah, 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 yes yes right yeah, yeah george gavin hope. was saying saying crypto is not being used at all uh, and Gambit's saying you're just looking in the wrong places it's yeah you, you, the coffee shops might not be open to accepting it but people that are purchasing things online in Argentina are are using crypto yeah I mean it makes sense like why wouldn't you but yeah. it, the, the chart he was posting was USDT which I thought was was funny because I've been shouting that like from the rooftops for two or three years now like USDT is going to beat Bitcoin for the monetary medium of exchange use case if they don't do something and they haven't done anything and they're not gonna. So the simple reality is that USDT in a lot of ways is 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 emerging the winner from this whole scaling bullshit. And I think USDT on like uh, rollups, Ethereum layer twos, and maybe Tron or Solana or wherever else they might implement, like USDT seems to be winning this fucking war. And that's that's really, really a big shame. Um, the good news is that like, again, Monero is still here functioning, doing what it's supposed to owning the dark nets. Um, you know, as like, which isn't, you know, obviously we shouldn't be saying, Hey, let's target dark nets, right? Like I don't really do drugs and I don't necessarily think drugs are great. Um, they can be useful, but anyways, um, it, it just shows that, Hey, this thing works in an austere environment. Like it's, it's functional when you really, really need um, that protection and people are always going to really, really need protection from time to time. So like Monero will always be there. Um, it'll always be um relevant even if it's not like winning you know like in the way the usdt is currently winning um one thing i wanted to point out here uh, shifting gears a little bit so to the monero transaction counts the fact that we saw this big drop off for like two weeks um from that you know over a hundred thousand all the way back down you know round tripping all the way to like twenty thousand almost if this was really a nefarious attack where these guys were trying to um unwind the chain and and Black have people. high probability they wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen this drop off. They would have just kept it above a hundred thousand. Like any entity at that level has more than enough funds to keep this rolling. They, they wouldn't have done that because that kind of screws up their, um, their ability to do the black ball chain analysis, right. To, to remove, um, outputs like that. That's, that's an entire section that they don't have. So my guess now, um, is that this is probably a friendly entity or at least a neutral entity. Maybe. Well, they, I mean, the, the, the argument could be though, that they want to make sure they keep the network usable. So people keep using it. Like, so they want to do spam it to the max to where they're not interfering with actual real usage because I mean, otherwise been... then what are they doing at that point? They're just, they're just the only ones using the network. And yeah. So there's really no one to even attack, gain data on. Yeah. So that's one like... of the ideas I had. Cause that's why that's the 10 K cap, because right. if they exactly. do so much, that's not usable. Well then they have, yeah, exactly. Um, but if body, you think it is a neutral entity, well then yeah, there has been some, uh, on the side, there has been some good things that, um, un you know, came out of this kind of in a way, uh, where, while fee bug was fixed and now full chain membership proofs are being mm. like fast forwarded basically which i don't know if that was purposeful or not but that's happening there's, so there's a lot of things that could be luke, accomplished luke, with luke um, parker luke parker just has a little <laughs> a little little server running on the side spamming the, <laughs> the monero network <laughs> he's like oh, a little more all right now they're moving. Now they're now moving. Got, every, now got, got everybody moving. Full membership membership proof. Proof. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the cost at spamming the network was something like a total of ten thousand dollars. There, maybe it was like twenty. Yeah. It was something like four or five hundred dollars a day to to spam the network. Nothing. Um, yeah, it's like for any like for a chain analysis entity, it would be nothing. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just have to think like it's we were nowhere near our, our maximum capacity on Monero as a network. The the network like everything was still usable minus some problems with the wallet. Um, well, there was no, a so, couple issues. It was the problem with the wallet B bug, um, and then it was also the node software does need some some work on it. Um, but like the the protocol as it is designed was definitely not reached its capacity because dynamic blocks only it, it didn't even end up going up super high. I think the maximum block size was like 360 kilobytes. Could have gotten way higher than that. Uh, but the node software definitely needs. Uh, some fixes and some efficiency improvements. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't argue with that. Um, just in a broader sense, I feel like there, there wasn't really a, a huge, it wasn't a huge deal, like in terms of being able to still use the network. There were some problems, there were some hiccups. By the time that these transaction, transactions dropped off, the main problems had already been addressed. So, I mean, yeah, people not getting their transactions for 40 minutes. That was just because of the fee bug. And that's like, that's a non issue now. So, I, every anytime anyone would use Monero, like now, even though it's 10K transactions, and I think right now it's like 4K, uh, they're not going to, not even going to notice, not going to feel it. Now, syncing will be slower and not because of the nodes. The node, some of the node issue has been dealt with, not necessarily the efficiency of Monero D, but I think people have around across the board bolstered up their nodes, made them more beefy. Um, another thing, which I had mentioned before, is that it will just take your phone longer to sync because there's way more transactions in each block. So instead of it being 50 to 100, now it's like, um, or less less than 100, now it's like 100, couple hundred transactions in a block. It will take your phone longer to process that. So it's not just nodes syncing slower. Your phone has to do more work. So there you go. Yeah, that's true. I guess I just so, want to I guess say... So I just wanted to throw out there, we were talking about this concept of the spam attack kind of spurring innovation and how well the network handled it. And uh, we, we are personally affected by it with the Noda. So we, we actually, out of this came the decision to raise the, the RAM in the Noda. So we doubled the RAM to 32 gigabytes. Um, so kind of future-proofing the Noda more towards being able to, to handle the, the network as it's used more. Um, so yeah, just is it extra something, cost something to bring up? Like standard. Yeah, no, we're ra we're raising the price of the Noto as well. Um, but a decision was made to you know at this point to to bump up the RAM, double it. Um, in talking with Arctic Mine and things, uh, you know, this it would just be the smart thing to do. Uh, so the you know we could we could kind of say that the Noto will be usable on the network for, you know, let's say eight years, right, uh, is what we were going for. I mean, the main issue with RAM isn't so much um, P2P as it is RPC traffic um, and the ability to quickly sync tons of devices. So uh, the mo the main advantage of having more RAM is that LMDB, which is the, the database that's used um, to have a, a lot of the, the information and memory, is going to be able to store more of the blockchain in RAM. So if you've got a lot of people syncing, then that's an advantage where Monero D doesn't have to use disk as much, which is much slower than RAM. So, Yeah, so we raised the price. So anybody uh, who has didn't purchase the Noto yet, we did we did raise the price and we increased the RAM. Uh, so the Notos are now 650 So... I mean, they they were too too low priced to begin with in terms of uh, making making things sustainable. But we wanted to to keep the price low in the beginning to get some some early adopters, which we did. We greatly appreciate all those people that did that. Um, and yeah, decision was made to to raise the RAM. And with that, we raised the price. Just six Monero, no big deal. <laughs> I could part with six Monero for a Noto. Yeah, that's an, another thing to note too, right? Is uh, there really would have been no hiccups if everybody was running their own node, right? Um, the issues we saw were obviously there. There, there was the, the wallet issue, right? But there, we wouldn't have been seeing that remote node issue. Where it like, wouldn't have been as bad. Now there's still like once again there's there's some locks between P2P traffic and mm -hmm. RPC part of of Monero D. Okay. Um, Sorry, sorry. So that that'll get that'll get worked out eventually. But yeah, if you did run your own node, you would have like not like theoretically, had... if everybody was running their own node in that instance, I think it would have been very 
very smooth. The right? difference I mean, is, yeah, way less noticeable if you yeah, just have yeah. one node that's got maybe a few RPC connections. It's. Mm -hmm. But I did notice yesterday my my little my little node computer sitting next to my desk. I did kept hearing the fan spin up. I was like, huh, what's going on? Hmm. Look at the transactions. I'm like, oh, that's what's going on. So yeah, <laughs> that's, that's funny. That's so you know just... when the transactions are bumping oh, yeah. just by the fan speed. <laughs> it does it does use a lot more CPU because of all the transactions that are that it's got a process, uh, and then the ones that are currently pending that's that are coming through. So it's just the P2P traffic at that point. Huh. We gotta just yeah, that's that's a good idea for something to display on the Noto as well, you know. In a nice way. TX dot town yes. always open. Yeah, no, TX dot town will like have that. on there, but awesome. the uh the usage of the Noto itself, right? Showing it's how much d demand it's currently under would be would be cool. You could put like a little light, like a LED, like maybe say <laughs> like five or six up. of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just like you get one more LED for every I don't know, every hundred thousand transactions or something that's sick you guys remember mordinals obviously yeah of course i actually one of the main you. one of the main guys that was <laughs> like doing the mordinals um he i remember chatting with him a little bit just on twitter or interacting with him some and he wasn't nefarious like in any way whatsoever he just like didn't act in a way that that seemed nefarious he was just like hey yeah. by the way he or she was like hey this can be done and we're doing it now and it was kind of a way to like push Monero, like, hey, address this issue. It's a fucking problem now. And through their action of Mordinals and proving how easy this actually was, that caused rapid a rapid response uh, in Monero. And the way that this this quote unquote attack is has unfolded, I mean, it it kind of makes me because think about it. They reduced the um, the Rucknium's research showed that maybe we reduced about five and a half ring sizes of five and a half effectively, like assuming that this was a chain analysis attack. Mm -hmm. um, but we still had like, you still had five and a half um, decoys effectively um, even during, you know, the heights of the attack. And then this thing drops off. It's like, okay, well, so it dropped back to baseline for a period of a couple weeks. And then, you know, now it's coming back up and in the process of doing that exposed some things in Monero that really needed to be fixed. If, if it's going to scale. Um, if this was really chain yep. analysis, they would have just kept the transactions high, and they probably would have pushed probably them even higher. higher. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah. a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So I feel, I really, it just seems, to me, it just smells like someone, kind of a, either a neutral or a good entity out there saying, hey, fix the problems, here's here's a stress test, here's, you know, here's a proof of concept, not concept, but like, here's how the dynamic blocks function, here's, you know, all the other stuff that we're discovering. So, I mean, I yeah, mean, but so chain far. analysis, I mean, they would be smart enough to uh, ramp it up slowly, make it look yeah. more natural, not so sudden, uh, to where it's like it's obvious something's going on. Because um, they, they could have ramped it up naturally. We just would have been like, oh, wow, more people are using Monero. It's getting yeah, up, yeah, yeah. really that yeah. thousands of these transactions yeah. are just. But then another big indicator is that uh, they're using the minimum fee. So also, if it was like a smarter adversary, they would they would take the extra money to make them look more um uh natural i like it natural yeah yeah they do they, they would probably take higher, a distribution of the different fees and the different outputs and try and mimic you know what the chain actually has been showing yeah i mean the, the adversaries out there the chain analysis adversaries are definitely um fairly advanced it used to be the case back in the day like with crypto volumes they would just <laughs> they would just blatantly inflate their volumes and you could run the statistical analysis like on the last digit, uh, stuff like that. Like the stuff they'll do um, with taxes, like they'll check your returns and, and check your last, your first and last digit or something like that and make sure that your your distribution is correct, like what it should be. And that's one of the ways that they'll find people that um, are cheating. Um, and they used to do that with volumes and people used to detect, hey, you're, you're lying about your volumes. And we know because you don't have a proper statistical distribution on like these different things. Um, and now they've, I'm sure they've gotten more sophisticated about that. So. Um, that, yeah, just kind of like in a long winded way, backing that, what you're saying there, Tux, like these, these guys, if they really, really wanted to pwn Monero's privacy by revealing the decoys, you would expect them to ramp it slowly and then mimic the transaction scenario. Cause they, they've got more than enough funds to do that if they wanted to. So I also tend to think these are problems that go away with adoption. Like if we have a hundred thousand, half a million transactions a day organically, um, suddenly it's a lot harder to overcome, yeah, you know, it's a lot harder to, to overcome that, to spam the, the, the network without incurring significant fees and without, um, you know, it's, it's harder to, to remove the decoys because uh, you have to do so many more transactions. Um, so anyways, I feel like that's those are kind of problems that largely alleviate with adoption.
And then of course full chain membership proofs. I mean that's that's gonna be like a huge a huge deterrence against the ability to do these black marble attacks. Yeah. I am still slightly eh. Is it a 5x increase on the transaction size? I think it's about a 5x. No, increase. it's not a 5x. Um, well, actually, actually, you might be right. Sure, actually, you might be right. Sure it's 5x. Is. Maybe there's efficiencies to be found, but it, it is pretty significant, which actually I'm pretty sure puts us somewhere in the neighborhood of Zcash transaction sizes at this point. So I remember correctly right now, um, about one kilobyte couple kilobytes for larger ones uh and then full chain membership proofs might bring that up to eight to ten i i, I remember what luke was saying so yeah those are those are the numbers i read i think it's 2.1 was the average transaction size a couple years ago 2.1 uh, kilobytes so, um you know maybe we should take a look at gold here guys gold has been performing probably there's people in the audience that hold gold um gold so, yeah, gold like crazy yeah, it's actually, I mean, you know, crazy for gold. <laughs> we could take a look. My yeah, God, 20% to the upside, which is more oh. than which is more than Monero gets these days. So it's um, kind of sad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but okay, yeah, we got the monthly chart here on gold. Um, things are moving towards the upside. At this point, um, it seems like it would make sense to tag this upper line here. You'll notice that this upper line goes way, way back all the way to 1980 when that first massive gold um, pump happened after they demonetized it. Which is weird, you know. It took like a whole decade, really, um, to to get that pump. Like the major pump started, you can see here in 1971, they severed the, you know, gold gold will float. Said gold will float relative to other currencies uh, as a temporary measure against the speculators. Uh, in the voice of Nixon, um, and then it took an entire decade to really like blow off top um, to the upside. But you notice that's where we draw our first pleb line here, and we have two connected pleb line points. And it certainly looks like we're headed that direction. Um, interestingly, this would maybe suggest that we could get another break of this very, very large rising resistance. Um, and it's difficult to believe that the in, in an inflationary environment such as we are in, where stocks and crypto and risk assets just go crazy, um, you know, and gold is still kind of like lagging behind. I really have to think that on a long time frame, you'll notice here down at the bottom, that's 2030. So on a long time frame, I really do have to think that this line is going to break. Um, I guess 2030 is getting closer every day, right? Um, just six more years, uh, maybe five and a half more years until we're, we're basically at 2030. So anyways, um, I mean, I would expect this thing to probably eventually tag this upper line to have some pullback. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's nice. You know, I've been saving in gold, um, like I've said, for a long time. It's stable. Uh, it should hold its value. Gold is actually a store of value. Gold is a real store of value. An asset that drops 80% is not a store of value. Like, I'm sorry. Bro, oh, but Bitcoin is digital gold, man. Oh, shit. You mean I can melt my Bitcoin and it's all the same and fungible? Nope. Uh, yeah. It's fungible enough, bro. Because the government said so. Here's an interesting chart that, um, that uh, I've showed you guys in the past. This is gold times the dollar index. Um, gold is basically anti-correlated with the dollar index. So if the dollar index is going up and gold is going up at the same time, that actually means gold is going up even more than you would think. Um, so it, it's interesting because um, this chart in a lot of ways was actually much cleaner. Um, one thing that you'll notice is that we're kind of coming to the top of these purple lines here. Let me draw that. I don't know if you can see it. Right there would be about the top of the purple lines, um, which would be... Dang it. There's got to be a quick key that I can switch from drawing lines to um, to not drawing lines. Anyways, that would be something like another 12% up. Let's compare that here. Can you guys tell I didn't like really not super prepared? Yeah, that would be another 12% up. Um, I would, so again, I would probably be looking for gold to top out here somewhere in the range of like 2,600. Um, does that mean I'll sell? I don't know. Maybe I might sell and like buy something real like a house, you know, or, a, or an airplane or something like that. I really need an airplane. <laughs> It would have been nice to go fly to the eclipse in my own airplane, um, which, you know, because I can't I can't rent any planes here in Mexico. I, uh, my my U.S. license and I man, I know I'm going to get a lot of hate here in the comments because I have a license, <laughs> which is like asking <laughs> for permission. To, yeah. I mean, hey, guys, it's, it is what it is. What are I mean, you going to do? You're flying an airplane, right? That's you're like, under duress. Yeah. I mean, I believe in training, though. Like, I, I don't believe in licenses, but I do believe in training. And the simple fact is. To get the license, like you would be shocked at how low the level, 
that you need to get a, a, a pilot's license. Like as I was passing my exam and they were, you know, they said I did like really well. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I barely feel competent, like to be flying myself around. Like, yes, I'm competent. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with it. But man, I could see my skill gap to my trainers, uh, to my instructors. I could see that skill gap. And I was just like, geez, um, like you, like you really, like if you can't pass the FAA exam, like you should not be flying an airplane period. Like that is the bare minimum. Anyway, so I don't believe in licenses, but I do believe in training and I do believe in competency, especially in a, a dangerous environment. Anyways, maybe I'll see if I can buy an airplane. So new gold floor 2K, you think? Gold gold never will ever fall below against uh, 2343. This is the bottom. No, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> probably this, <laughs> probably floor 2000 is, is probably about right. Um, like this, this line right here, this pleb line, we will probably never go below that again. Um, that will probably end up being, there will be some pullback at some point, And maybe this will be the line that it comes back down to. So like 2100. I mean, with the U.S. Gov adding three more trillion to the government budget on a whim, you know, that's not likely to happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's like, what would that be? Um, 20% of the market cap of gold just got added, you know, in the last in the last few years. Uh, let's take a look at gold versus silver, because, you know, when gold starts performing and people are convinced that gold is doing good, silver should perform. And that's kind of what we see here. Uh, let's go to a shorter time frame. Maybe we'll look at the weekly. So this is gold divided by silver so when this chart goes up that means gold is performing better than silver when it goes down that means silver is winning and you'll notice you know as of late we've we've had silver um has been outperforming gold to the tune of about 10 percent um i got burned back in the day with silver so i just kind of <laughs> ended up sticking with gold um, <laughs> it seems like silver is kind of is, do you think silver has been suppressed Probably. Yeah. I mean, it's, it truly is. If you think about it, like gold is, is the store of value. It's like what Bitcoiners talk about the store of value, uh, but no one really wants to use it that much. Uh, but silver is actually the medium of exchange in a lot of ways because it's, you know, it's money for, for the people, money for the plebs. Um, and they demonetize silver. And I think that they really, I don't think that they want silver to have a high price. I don't think they want people to feel like they can use it in a monetary capacity. Um, that, and we need silver for all of our electronics. So the, the monetary use case of silver definitely um, competes with the industrial use case. And we really, really do need silver. I mean, I, I know um, gold is still more valuable for electronics uh, because of its corrosion resistance and its resistance to rust. But like, it's still like $2,000 compared to $28 an ounce kind of difference. No, definitely not. In terms of usability, yeah, if, I feel like in electronics. Yeah, we could look at maybe let's go to like very long time frames here, maybe three month chart. I'll turn off the wave magic. Um, yeah, so here this is like the lifetime gold versus silver chart. Um, you'll notice so back in like 1939, we were about these same levels, you know, 100 to one. We're still pretty high up there, 84 to one, right? So every ounce of silver, I'm sorry, every ounce of gold is worth 84 ounces of silver as of today. And you'll notice that uh, with the. Mm, the, the 2020 spike, the 2020 events, um, we saw gold massively, massively spike up. Honestly, that's kind of one thing I'm waiting for. Like, it's a, it's another thing that if you get this tail risk event, and again, a tail risk event, meaning that a very low likelihood event that has severe effects. So in terms of markets, when we say tail risk, what we mean is that the risk of the S&P crashing 50%, right? The risk of another 2008, another uh, March 2020 event where everything just smashes to the downside, right? Very low chance of it happening, but very high consequence of it happening. That's that's a tail risk event. During tail risk events, gold massively outperforms silver, um, typically. Like you'll notice here, that was an overperformance of 50%. But in the middle of that tail risk event, at the depths of it, um, that's when you switch from gold into silver. But why would you do that? You should just switch from gold and silver into stocks. But why would you do that? You should just switch from stocks into crypto, right? Like as long as it's game on, you might as well just go high beta, like all the way, like just smash the high risk um, buy button. Um, but anyways, yeah, historically speaking, really gold to silver ratio should be closer to around like 40 to one. So gold is probably overvalued relative to silver by about 2x um, from, from a historical standpoint, right? Um, so that's just one way of looking at it. Uh, we'll take a look at gold versus the NASDAQ. That's an interesting chart that we've never, we haven't really looked at. These are the monthly candles. So you'll notice very long time frames. Um, and uh, I mean, basically from that top in 1980, when gold was just super, super valuable, 
you'll notice that it just with the with the tech stocks and everything coming into view during the 80s and during the 90s, uh, man, you just massive, massive, massive underperformance of gold relative to stocks. Um, you had the decade of the aughts, right, from 2000 basically to, to 2011. Um, gold had a massive performance to the upside. Uh, and then again, since then, right, um, since the zero interest rate environment um, and the, the quantitative easing environment um, that the Fed has had, we've just, we just had um, massive, just a, a down, down, down for gold. It seems, seems kind of like we're bottoming out here. Um, gold does seem to be bottoming out relative to the S&P. Um, you know, is this, is, is this the time is, is this when gold finally breaks to the upside? Can we get ourselves, you know, a hundred percent gain relative to the S and P man, I would hope, I'd hope so. I'd like to see that. Um, it seems like it's due. It seems like it's overdue. Um, but you know, there, there's no guarantees there that that might not necessarily happen again. Uh, the forces. And if you wanted to say the principalities <laughs> for those that speak like that, um, you know, the, the forces and principalities we're fighting against, um, they 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 are quite nefarious and they are quite wily quite quite tricky they um they got all kinds of tricks up their sleeve uh, okay so this is uh these are the z scores on relative metals so you'll notice that's gold silver copper nickel platinum and aluminum and the different colors here um i don't know i just thought it was interesting I figured i'd show you guys this chart i've had this for a while one trading thing i've had for a long time that i've never implemented because it would require me to be on the more traditional markets um you know with the custodians and the kyc and all that shit um You'll, you'll notice that a lot of these metals, um, they go in, in turns, like in different turns. Like you'll see a bunch of the metals pump and like, so nickel here recently, nickel and red, um, had kind of come down. Like it was down, 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 even as the rest of the metals were pumping, um, there would have been an opportunity here to get into nickel for a pretty high likelihood upside trade. Um, just by looking at what the rest of the metals, these scores were doing. I don't know. That's some ideas. If anyone out there trades, <laughs> trades metals, um, in a broader sense, you know, platinum and copper and all this different stuff. Um, hit me up if you want the Z score script, I'll, I'll send it your way. Um, okay. Uh, let's take a quick look at macro stuff and then we'll call it a day. I think it's been, been a little bit long here in the tooth. Um, we got the reverse repos. Uh, we had a little spike there temporarily coming back down again, as long as these have juice, um, mana to give the markets should still make higher highs. I would think, um, right now as of Friday, um, we had, Overall, more more money come out of the reverse repos. Um, so, just because things have fallen out of their trend doesn't mean that they're not going to set another all time high. Like the mar stock market could easily still set another all time high, even if we're in like a months long topping um, kind of pattern here. Um, which I'm not necessarily saying, but I mean I, I I am suspicious, right, of how fast things have gone up. But then again, with all the inflation, right, hard, hard to say. Um, oh, Dixie, Dixie was another one. Dixie actually is starting to become slightly relevant again. Um, it's, it's gone kind of, kind of an upswing here. You'll notice that we basically, we touched those, uh, upper standard deviations, the near term, the local upper standard deviations pulled back, touched them again. And now, um, Dixie, eh, to me, it looks like it probably wants to make it up here, right? It wants to make it to these, these even more long-term upper standard deviations. So for as long as that's happening, we could probably expect a little bit of, um, friction in the risk assets, right? Crypto and stocks. We could probably expect some friction here um, until this thing finds some top, maybe pulls back for a little bit, uh, and then maybe we maybe we'd start looking. Maybe Bitcoin hits 80k um, again, right? That's like it's it's all speculative. I'm just saying, hey, this is the way things might unfold if they unfold in certain ways. You start saying, okay, we have charts, congruencies lining up. I would hope that in a big macro reversal of crypto and stocks, that just like we saw at the beginning or the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023. Where he said, hey, all of these different macro signals are starting to line up. Everything is changing. You can see the shifts happening, right? You, you can see that there's there's a reversal coming, a big reversal for upside. Um, I would hope that we would see something similar and we'd be able to corroborate all these charts together um, in a way that um, that really makes sense, right? In a way that's, that's coherent um, if we start seeing some kind of topping action in the market. I still say that we're not there. I still say that there's there's probably room to go. I'm just some dude um, speculating on price, right? So uh, I could be wrong and I'm not, um, you know, I'm not like hardcore in markets and charts like I used to be back in 2021, 22 and uh, the beginning of 2023. I just, you know, working on some other projects. Um, I'm, I still pay attention to markets every day, but I'm not like hardcore eating, living, breathing, sleeping this stuff like I, like I did for a couple of years. So just want you guys to be aware of that. Uh, okay. Bonds, nothing's happening with bonds. They're kind of moving up. If you like to buy bonds, maybe you could buy some bonds here because they're, they're like almost at 5% now. Um, but 
nothing, nothing dangerous happening here. So again, overall to me, the picture still looks, um, I don't know, flat, right? It just looks like consolidation with the potential to make some, some higher highs here, um, going into the future. Um, that doesn't mean mad gains necessarily, although you'll, if you choose the right coins, you, you know, you can get a two X, three X, four X bump here and there. Um, if you are so inclined to do so. Um, so with that, I think that's about all I've got. That's all I got to say about that. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. One more thing. Sorry. One more thing. Oh, he's got one more. <laughs> one more Encore. One more um, speculation. Uh, Gox has been repaying the cash um, to people. They haven't been repaying the crypto, the Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash. But for like the past, mm, I think about month, um, people, I think, so Gox has two things they owe people. One is fiat and one is crypto. Um, they have been repaying the fiat. I think they're like maybe halfway there. It's hard to say because all we get are... Um, like these little polls on Reddit, like the Mount Gox Rehabilitation or Mount Gox Insolvency subreddit, um, like they'll put little polls up. Have you gotten repaid? And it seems like uh, it's about half and half right now. So just know that um, Gox is actually repaying people. And apparently the crypto portion is coming. How long? I don't know. But um, yeah, that's just a small little, small little piece of information there. And now for real, though, I don't have anything else after that. I promise. Till next week. All righty, man. Comprehensive as always. Thank you, buddy. That was fantastic. Sure thing. Riddled Thanks, with 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 many insights beyond beyond price.